Okay, great. So the speaker today is Damiel Mazak on dispersive CFT SEM rules. All right, go ahead. Thank, 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 thanks, Tom, for the introduction, and th thank, thanks for having me give, give, the, give the online seminar for the Bootstrap collaboration. It's a, it's a great pleasure. And uh, yeah, as Tom said, I will talk about uh, dispersive CFT SEM rules. So hopefully by the end of the talk, you'll have some idea what, uh, what that's supposed to mean. And uh, it's, it will be mostly based on a, on a paper that we, that we recently wrote with a set of wonderful collaborators, Simon, Leonardo, and, and David. And please, uh, throughout the talk, uh, don't hesitate to ask me, ask me any questions. I should be following the chat, but it's, it's probably better if you, like, if you, if you just uh, unmute yourself and, and ask if there's anything unclear. Okay, uh, let, me, let me start with some motivation. So I, here I have, I have some twofold motivation on this slide, uh, but there could probably be others, which I didn't include. But let, 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 me, let me just uh, yeah, let me say what's on the slide. Uh, so first motivation is that one would like to have an approach to the analytic bootstrap, which is sort of more, more rigorous than the analytic light cone bootstrap, which is, which, which, where you can derive some rigorously bounded errors. So in a sense, it would be like a hybrid between, uh, between the numerical bootstrap and the analytic light cone bootstrap. Why, why, why do I say that? Well, it, the, the virtue of the numerical bootstrap is that it's, it's rigorous. You know, once you, if, if you work at some finite truncation in a number of derivatives and you, you, you derive some exclusion, you know that that exclusion is rigorous. There cannot be any operator outside of the allowed range. So that's, that's good that it's rigorous. On the other hand, it's, it's numerical. So that's, that's probably a downside. It would be better to, to have something more analytic like that. Uh, so on, and on the other hand, here on the right, um, there's the analytic light cone bootstrap, which, uh, which is analytic, so that's good. But it's, it, it doesn't really lead to, a, to such a controlled approximation. Like it's, in particular, so if, you, if you're talking about, if you're trying to derive the anomalous dimensions of double trace operators, uh, the light cone bootstrap gives you some prediction, uh, but in, in the form, in the form of a, of a sum over operator, the other operators in the theorem. But this, this sum is only asymptotic. It, it doesn't converge. You, you, cannot, you, know, you, you cannot get a bounded error, a rigorous bounded error out of that. So somehow the ambition here is to have, a, have some uh, approach which combines the virtues of the numerical bootstrap, which is the rigor, and the unlike light cone bootstrap, which is the, that's, that's analytic. Uh, secondly, the other motivation is that uh, we, one would like to systematically derive bounds on holographic CFTs, so to have some kind of a large central charge version of the of the numerical bootstrap. I I, I don't have to convince you that the numerical bootstrap is extremely powerful to to constrain uh, CFTs with low central charge, such as the three D Ising model, which leads to some beautiful exclusions, islands which uh, shrink to a very very small size. But uh, we don't really. We haven't had such a great success in, in constraining holographic CFTs in, using the same approach. So if, if, you, if you say think of holographic CFTs as being parametrized by the, by, the, by the effective field theory data, say by the spectrum of light single trace operators and uh, the, 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 contact, uh, the contact interactions between them, then, uh, that, then we, we, we want to have some approach which which can which can lead lead to exclusions in this in this parameter space. You know, so it's like in a in a similar way that uh, we have a beautiful island for the three D Ising model, we would like to have some island in the in the swampland maybe w w one day. I mean, we we don't have that, but uh, that's that's sort of the ambition. So the way forward, which I'm going to propose today, and on these on these sets of questions, is to is to use exact sum rules. On the OP data, which suppress double twist operators, uh, and this 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 kind of sum rule I'm going to call dispersive. So the dispersive sum rule just means a sum rule which suppresses double twist operators in a sense, which I'm going to make make more, make more precise soon. Now, the, for example, the reason why suppression of double twist operators is important for for these bounds on holographic CFTs is that like if you if you have some if you have some numerical bootstrap bound which proves a say, like an upper bound on the gap. You 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 don't know whether whether that operator which has to sit below that bound is single trace or double trace or what kind of operator it is. So, there, yeah, the, some numerical bootstrap is is blind to the distinction between single traces and double traces. So you can always saturate the bounds by double traces, and you, you haven't really learned about the single trace spectrum. So that, that's why it's useful to suppress uh, uh, double twist operators. Okay. Uh, yeah. 
Um, are there any, any questions about, about this sort of big, broad uh, motivation so far? If not, uh, let me just uh, let me just set the stage, um, introduce some notation. So the, in the rest of the talk, I'll talk about uh, everything will be about a four-point function of identical scalars in some unitary CFT. So we usually write it like this with a, with a you know function of z and z bar, which is the which is the, the sort of reduced four-point function, and we can expand it using uh, two OPEs, say. Uh, uh, that, that leads to the crossing equation. So we can explain it in the conform of blocks. There are some C O squared, which are positive numbers on both sides. Uh, on one side, we have the S channel blocks and the other side, T channel blocks, and only even spins can appear in this OPE because they're identical scalars. Now the, this equation already gives you a two, parameter, two complex parameter family of sum rules on the OPE parameterized by Z and Z bar in some suitable ranges. So that's, that's good. Uh, and more generally, you can uh, you can act with functionals on this equation. So we, we can have some functional omega, which sends uh, functions of two complex variables to, to numbers. And uh, because the equation is anti-symmetric, is symmetric on the crossing without loss of generality, we can take this to be anti-symmetric. And uh, under some suitable conditions, in particular, if, this, if the action of this functional commutes with the OPE, we derive a sum rule, which is here at the bottom which is just that the, the sum over the primary operators times the three point function squared times the action of the functional on the operator uh, is equal to zero. So all the, all the sum rules that in this talk will be of this form in principle. There is always some underlying functional that you can act on, uh, act with on the, on the crossing equation, which commutes with the OPE. Uh, but but I'm not always going to make it too explicit. So there there, there, there are different ways to derive these sum rules. But uh, you can like if if you're not you know if if you're not say comfortable working with working in Mellon space, uh, rest assured that there is always some some underlying uh, functional that acts on the position space crossing equation and just uses the uses the equality of two Euclidean OPEs. Okay, so uh, without further ado, let me tell you more, ex more precisely what is a dispersive sum rule. So it's, it's just a special case of, of, a, of a general sum. It's just a special case of this omega. So I'm gonna call functional or sum rule omega dispersive if it has double zeros on all double trace operators above a fixed twist. So the, the, uh, here double traces means the, the double trace of Meffield theory without any anomalous dimension, just dimensions 2 delta phi plus 2n plus spin. Spin is denoted L. So these two equations tell us that um, the first one is just that the functional vanishes on all double, on all double traces above some twist. So n, n, n is uh, essentially the twist of the, of the double, twist op or double trace operator. And the second equation tells us that uh, it also the derivative there vanishes derivative with respect to delta. So the, the, these, just, these just mean that there is a double zero at all n and l above uh, some critical value of n and n zero. So if I plot the function, the, the action of the functional as a, as a function of, uh, of the twist or dimension and, and spin, this is what it looks like. From a, from a certain point onwards, there are double zeros on all the double twist operators and there, there can be sort of anything going on in the in the region of smaller twists. Often, often it will be useful for the functional to be positive or non-negative in this region where it has double zero, so from some twist onwards, but that's that's not really a part of the definition. And uh, the definition just means that there, there are double zeros. So it, it will it, it's not always important, but very often it's useful for it to be to be positive there. Are there any questions about the definition so far? Are you are you going to explain the reason of the name, the intuition? Uh, yes. Yeah. Good. Good question. Yes, I will. It, but I can say it also now. It's just uh, because these sums naturally come from dispersion relations, in a sense, which I'll hopefully cover. Okay. Yeah. So in 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 this first part of the talk, I'm just I'm just saying some motivations and what these things are, and later on, I'm going to tell you how to actually derive examples from dispersion relations.
So why are such summary rules useful? So to, let me address the, the first point uh, in, the, in the motivation. How, how does it lead to rigorous errors in the analytic bootstrap? So let's, let's suppose we have a kind of a special case of a dispersive sum rule, namely one which has double zeros on all except for a single double trace operator. So the double trace operator, which is with the specific label NNL. Okay, so it, it vanishes on all double trace operators for all NNL and the, the first derivative vanishes on all except for one. So that's why there is this Kronecker delta on the right. Now, this such a sum rule, in a sense, allows us to solve for the anomalous dimension of that specific double trace operator where the functional has a, has a simple zero. Why is that? Well, we apply the functional, we have, a, we, have this, we have this sum rule, and we can put the contribution of that double twist operator on, on the left-hand side, and the contribution of all the other operators to the right-hand side. Now, because of the simple zero uh, at the leading order, some, some of, well, if, if, you, if this anomalous dimension is small, which it, it doesn't have to be, but let, let's imagine that it's small, then the left-hand side is just the OP coefficient square times the anomalous dimension at the, at the leading order in the size of this anomalous dimension. There, and there are some higher order corrections, which, which you know if you know what this, how this functional acts. On the other hand, on the right-hand side, we have all the other operators in the theory. So in some sense, this function, this summary gives you a formula for the anomalous dimension in terms of all the other operators in the theory. Now, it's important that this function has double zeros on all the other double traces because that means that they are they are separate. They don't they don't appear at the leading order on the right hand side. So we kind of we kind of diagonalized the crossing equation with respect to n and l in this in this way. Now and why why does it lead to rigorous errors? So well for that you need to know some extra information about omega. So for example, imagine that omega is sine uniform that it's that, that it's positive uh, every. Suppose that it's non-negative everywhere where the operators on the right-hand side appear. That means that by, by including more and more operators on the right, I can only, I can only make the right-hand side more and more negative. So th this, this will give you some, by, by including any finite number of operators on the right-hand side that you say no, you'll, you'll produce a rigorous upper bound on the left-hand side. Okay, now the left-hand side is not quite just the almost dimension because there's the OP coefficient, so there are some subtleties, but this is hopefully the rough idea is clear, that there is some exact sum rule which you can use to do analytic bootstrap because it diagonalizes uh, the problem with respect to N and L. Now, it's, it's quite different from what the Lightcomb bootstrap does uh, because the later, as I, as I said, doesn't, doesn't really give you a sum rule like that. Like it, it you can, you can make sense of a contribution of an individual operator to the anomalous dimension gamma and L, but if you try to sum all these contributions, you, you find infinity because it's, it's, it's not a convergent sum. On the other hand, here, the sum coming from dispersive sum rule is convergent. Also, such sum rules, uh, although I won't really have time to discuss it, they, they also make sense at, at uh, L equal to zero. So even in the region where you can't really trust the inversion formula in general. Okay, so that uh, that hopefully that hopefully convinces you that uh, dispersive sum rules could be useful for something. And if it doesn't, uh, let me let me say another reason, which is uh, which is how it can be used in holographic bootstrap. This, uh, this idea was also sketched in a, in a recent paper that came out actually a couple of days ago by, by these uh, people. So again, it's, it's crucial that the approximate double traces are suppressed in that case. So let, 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 me, let me first tell you what, what, what does the OP in holographic CFTs look, look like. So let's consider some four-point function of identical scalars as, as always in this talk. Expanded in conformal blocks. Okay, now, now what does it mean that we have a holographic CFT? So there is some large parameter, the central charge, or rather we have a one parameter family of these of these four-point functions, parameters by central charge, which goes to infinity. That means we can make sense of single trace, double trace, etc. And also we have this parameter delta gap, which is uh, which is the gap in the spectrum of 
of, uh, of single trace operator. So somehow for twist the below delta gap, all that we have are multi traces or that means single uh, are double traces of the external operator and their multi traces, as well as some finite number of single traces, which are just the light fields in your effective in your bulk effective field theory. So now when you when we expand this at, at large C, um, the light contributions include identity. That's that's already at the leading order in one over C to the zero, and then the double traces. As, uh, okay, uh, that, that's that's still at the order one over C to the zero. And at order one over C, these double traces get corrected. They have some anomalous dimensions and anomalous OP coefficients. And we also have added, we have the light effective field, sort of the, the, the light single traces appearing in the OP. And then uh, the, above, above delta gap, there is the UV completion, which can be something arbitrarily complicated. And we, we don't really want to make extra assumptions about that. So now let's let's imagine applying a dispersive functional to the to the crossing equation for this uh, for this setup, the holo holographic setup. And let's let's suppose that it has it is it has double zeros for all double traces above the above delta gap. So the, the reason why this is useful is that it allows you to to cleanly separate the light contributions from the heavy contributions in the in the crossing equation. So at, actually, you you find that at order one over c to zero, the sum rule is trivial because identity exactly cancels with the mean field theory, the disconnected uh, part, the the double traces. So leading leading order is at one over c, coming from the sum rule. And uh, the contribution from the light operators is completely computable from your low energy Lagrangian. So you can assume some version Lagrangian, compute the left-hand side. And uh, well, the right-hand si right side comes from the heavy operators. And that can be, I mean, that can be in principle anything. But uh, what's, what's important is that there are, there are many examples of these, of these dispersive functionals for which the left-hand side is, is non-vanishing so for, for some simple EFT. Say if you just take a, take the graviton exchange in the three channels, so crossing symmetric uh, correlator to the graviton exchange, then there are many examples of these dispersive functionals for which it's, it's non-zero, which, which means that the right-hand side also has to be non-zero. So it, it tells you something about the UV completion. It, it, tie, it, it, yeah, it, it gives you an e equation relating the IR and the UV. And uh, if you can make sure that this functional is sign uniform on the on the heavy operators, it gives you some sign constraint on the on the EFT. So like an example of that is the is the famous statement that the cup, the, the partial the, the del phi to the four coupling for a massless scalar non gravitational scalar in ADS has to be has to be positive. So that's that's a, something you can derive from it. It's actually explained in this uh, this nice paper. Uh, so in, in general, you get constraints on the low energy effective field theory from UV completeness derived from for the bootstrap logic. Uh, question. Mm -hmm. um, so you you took in the definition that the functions commute with UP. Is there any further assumption so that they commute with the one over C expansion, or is that automatic? That's that's not really an assumption. It's you you're applying it to you're applying the functional to so like you imagine applying it to a finite C theory. Well, you, you imagine you have, a, you have a one parameter family of finite C theories where C goes to infinity. Then you apply it to each of them. So you get a family of sum rules parameterized by C and then you take C to infinity. So for, for each C, you know, for, for each C you have a valid sum rule and then you ask what does this sum rule look like at a leading order at large C? You, you, you know, th th there is no commuting I mean, it's it's a little subtle, but it's you're not really commuting limits. You know, the sum rule is valid for every c, so it also has to be valid for a very large c. So, what does it look like at a leading order? And you can show that uh, the, lead, the light contributions are perturbative. You can just compute them using the EFT, and the heavy contributions can be perturbative or non-perturbative. It doesn't really matter as long as this omega is sign uniform. Actually, Daniel, I would like to follow up on this question because you when you write phi 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 equals what you wrote plus over of one over c squared. This one over c squared 
is what is it uniform and is it in for all uh, in all region of parameter space where the four point function is defined or is it in the bulk so uh, if the functional omega is going to probe some region of your cross ratio space where this one over c squared bound is not uniform then i think the issue that marco brought up may come into play yeah, that's because that's... your functional omega is going to be some complicated integral as you usually do, right? So sure. you have to be uh, careful. No? Yeah, yeah. The, you need to be you need to be careful, but actually, it's it's not a it's not a problem. Um, so where the, where does this one over c squared bound hold? Is it hold? Does it hold everywhere, or does it hold only some part of cross ratio space? Well, okay. It's it's true that you you, you can worry in principle. Okay, but, uh, the, the answer to uh, the answer to the question is that uh, everything is rigorous. Uh, e even like, even if there are, even if there are issues with with expanding in one over c, like it, it's true. For example, at higher and hard, higher orders in one over c, the Regi behavior of the correlator will become worse and worse. That's that's true, but that's that's not an issue here because we are like as, as I responded to Marco, we are applying the functional to to finite C theories, which where there's some non-perturbative regi bound. And uh, then we are just asking how do, how do different operators contribute to, to the sum rule at the leading order in one over C. And, uh, I, I guess, I guess the, the, this confusion arises because you're applying something very rigorous, which is your dispersive functional to some concept, which is not very rigorously defined, which is a, a family of holographic CF, CFTs, mm -hmm. and what is the assumption about C going to infinity limit? Um, Th yeah, this is not defined by your equation. Yeah, I think the only assumption that I need is that somehow the low energy data behaves uniformly in one over C, that you can, that the anomalous dimensions of double trace operators for little delta gap, they are, you know, they can be expanded at one over C. And there is no assumption about the heavy operators because uh, if you can make this omega sine uniform, that's all you need. But okay, this was—I mean, this was not really supposed to be the the main topic of the of the talk. Maybe I'm. Yeah, okay. we are still like, we are still kind of trying to work out some of the consequences, but uh, I think it's just sort of a. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so that's in, enough for enough for the motivational part. And uh, now I should tell you where do these dispersive sum rules come from? How do we how do we construct them? And uh, some of one of the main points of of our recent paper is that uh, they come from many different places, and you can show that these different approaches are actually equivalent at the end of the day. So one one way. One way that you can think of think about them, which is is just that how how I I first uh, came to work on them, is uh, some functionals applied to the crossing equation, as I explained. Some you know some judiciously chosen integral kernels integrated against the crossing equation. So that that gives you some rigorous control, but uh, it doesn't necessarily tell you the physical physical principles behind. And there, are, there are other ways to see the princi physical principles more clearly. So in our paper, we explained uh, how the sum rules come from dispersion relations in uh, either position space or in, in melon space. So in particular, we showed that uh, dispersion relation in position space is equivalent to the simple dispersion relation in, in melon space. And these, these sum rules are actually equivalent to the Polyakov conditions that were discussed in this uh, in, in paper by Joao, Joao and Sasha, and also in the more recent paper also, so with Dean. And, and finally, there also seems to be a connection with superconvergence, superconvergence sum rules uh, that we kind of touch upon in the paper, but we, I, I think we don't really fully understand the connection to superconvergence sum rules yet. So I, I'm, I'm not gonna discuss that too much now. I'm yeah, I, I will focus on this uh, on the dispersion relations point of view. But 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 uh, somehow fundamentally, fundamentally the reason these dispersion relations hold is is due to causality and more generally consistency in in Lorentzian signature. So some 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 kind of uh, well the the first you know the first uh, 
was one of the first places where such constraints were discussed was in, in papers uh, by Tom and, and collaborators. But yeah, it's 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 really all about dispersion relations. So let let me let me now tell you more about dispersion relations. Yeah, so this is probably the most technical slide of the talk, and it's uh, supposed to supposed to sketch uh, the connection between the well, it's supposed to sketch the dispersion relation moment space and position space and the connection between them. But the the, the final the final message is that they are equivalent. So on the left, we have melon space, on the right, we have position space. And I'll first go through uh, the left hand side in melon space, and then I'll, I'll go through the right hand side. So in, in melon space, we, we talk about the melon amplitude, M, S of T, S, S, T are the melon variables. There's also U, which is constrained by S plus T plus U is uh, some constant, depending on delta phi. And uh, let's let's think about this m of s and t as a function of complex s at a fixed value of the of the cross ratio u. Now the probably the most important thing about this Mellin amplitude is that physical operators in the OP show up as poles of the Mellin amplitude. So there are s, s channel poles show up as uh, s channel. Primary operators show up as poles uh, coming, go, going, going all the way to the right, where the twist, twist increases to the right. And t-channel operators, they show up here on the left because we are, you know, remember we are keeping u fixed, which means that uh, sort of increasing t-channel twist is like decreasing s to keep u fixed. So that's why t-channel operators go to the left. And um, the, the residues at these, at these locations are some functions of t, and they are they are completely fixed by conformal symmetry. So, you know, this, is, this is just a statement of OPE in Allen space. This picture. Now, suppose we want to uh, now suppose we want to compute m of s t at some at some location. There's this location of this blue dot, and we, we can we can use it. We can do it using the OPE uh, thanks to the just Cauchy integral formula. So we apply the Cauchy integral formula to the Mellin amplitude. So integrate around the circle with some with the Cauchy kernel, like one over s minus s prime, and then we pull the contour to the other to the other poles, to the poles corresponding to the s channel operators and to the t channel operators. Now it's it's actually important that we divide the Mellin amplitude first. So it, we we don't just apply Cauchy to m, but we need to we need to sort of improve the high energy behavior of m of s t because the, yeah, the, the this high, this, this high energy, high S behavior is related to the to the Reggie bound. And in non-perturbative CFTs, this Reggie bound basically tells you that M increases at most linearly at large S. Um, yeah, I think that's right. So we need to we need to divide, you know, in order to be able to drop the contour at infinity, we need to divide by something quadratic. So that's uh, this S minus two delta phi, T minus two delta phi. And when we do that, we get such a, this nice dispersion relation where we basically get a M S of T as a sum of two pieces. The first piece, which is the, the one in red, M S S of T is the one which is just the sum over all the S channel poles here on the right. And uh, the other one, the one in green is this, the, the one coming from the sum over the T channel poles. Okay, so that was the discussion in Mellon space. Now we can, we can derive another dispersion, well, equivalent dispersion relation in position space, which kind of mimics these steps. And uh, what it what it means is that we'll get a we'll get a formula for the position space four point function g of z z bar, which only depends on the double discontinuity of the of the four point function. So let's let's work in this uh, in this setup where where we uh, have the four point, well, the four point function has, has two cuts as a function of z and z bar in both, both variables, one starting at zero, going to minus infinity, that's the S channel cut. So S channel operators show up as some poles, so as, as some as powers, some non-integer powers uh, with a branch cut starting at zero. And T channel operators similarly produce this T channel cut uh, starting at one. 
And the, the double discontinuity, so we, we, have, uh, we have the double discontinuity around the S channel and around the T channel, and the double discontinuity is essentially, first you take discontinuity with respect to Z and then respect to Z bar. That produces the sine squared uh, because each discontinuity in Z produces one sign, discontinuity in Z bar produces the other sign. So you, you yeah, this, this is not the way that the double discontinuity is usually discussed, uh, but uh, it's, it's equivalent. And yeah, so the position space dispersion is a formula which gives you the correlator as a sum of two pieces, one piece which depends on the S channel D disk and then the other piece which depends on the T channel D disk with some integral, with some integral kernel, which, uh, which was found by Dean and Simon. So we are integrating with respect to W and W bar here, uh, the S channel double discontinuity and uh, so the, the kernel needs to depend on the free variables, easy bar, and on the integrated variables, w, w bar. And wh why does this have a chance to be related to the Mellon space dispersion relation? Well, in, in Mellon space, so in, in Mellon space, double trace operators do not show up as poles of the Mellon amplitude because they, they are already in, the, in, the, in these gamma factors of the Mellon amplitude. So it's, the, this M, M of S, the, the red MS. Okay, I, I, I'm sorry that I don't, don't have a pointer, but uh, actually, can, 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 you, can you see my, can you see my, my cursor or no? Yeah, yeah, yes. we can. Oh, you, you can, great. Oh, okay, I didn't realize. So this, uh, this uh, M of MS does not really, in, well, it, it depends on a double discontinuity only because uh, the, the, the exact double trace operators would not show up as poles, as channel poles. So that's, the, the, in that sense, uh, you can think of MS as depending only on the S channel D disk and MT as depending only on the T channel D disk. And uh, well, in, in our paper, we show in detail that this simple Cauchy dispersion relation actually leads to the, this, the position space dispersion relation derived by Simon, where the kernel, you can also check that the kernel in position space exactly agrees. It's some, uh, relatively complicated looking function with uh, some rational prefactor and some, some elliptic function like 2F1, some crazy crazy ratio of ZZ bar, W and W bar, but uh, miraculously uh, they, they end up to be the same formula. Okay, are there, are there any questions about that? Okay, so now that we have a position, we have a, some position space uh, dispersion relation, the next step towards deriving the sum rules is, the, is what we called polyakov rajay expansion in my paper with Leonardo and, and Shinan. So the polyakov rajay expansion is just a different way of thinking about the uh, about dispersion relation. So uh, remember that uh, position space dispersion implies that the Correlator is a sum of two pieces, the S channel piece and the T channel piece. The S channel piece is just uh, some kernel applied to the S channel D disk. The T channel piece is the crossing symmetric kernel. Well, it's a similar kernel applied to the T channel D disk. And now what, what you can do is to, is to expand this GS and GT using the OPE. So we more specifically, we expand the S channel D disk using the S channel OP and the T channel D disk using the T channel OP. So then you get this, this kind of formula where the, you get a formula for the correlator as a sum over certain objects uh, that uh, we call the polyakov regi blocks, the S channel and the T channel polyakov regi, regi blocks. And what are, well, mathematically speaking, these polyakov regi blocks is just the result of applying the dispersion relation to individual conformal blocks. So the S channel polyakov regi block is the function that you get when you apply the, this K kernel to the double discontinuity of an S channel conformal block and similarly for the T channel. And, but, but you can actually give a more physical description of these functions. It turns out that they are precisely with an exchange diagrams. And actually, they can be they can be fixed even if you don't know what this crazy kernel is. Like just 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 from some basic basic principles. Um, so it it turns out that uh, 
well, here, here are on here on the left are the principles that one can use to to fix these functions even without knowing the k k kernel. Essentially, in, in general, in the dispersion relation, it's true that the astronaut disk of G is completely captured by the astronaut disk of this uh, GS. And that, that implies that the teachable D disk of GS is zero. So that's that's here on the on the right. So essentially these functions have to be some single valued objects whose astronaut D disk equals the astronaut D disk of the conformal block and whose teachable D disk vanishes. Um, some D disk vanishing means that you can expand it in the channel just using double trace operators. So this this polyco virtual block looks has to has to have just from these basic principles needs to have this kind of S and T channel OPE. In the S channel, there is a single trace, like there's the there's the block, the single trace block, and some double traces. And in the T channel, there are only double traces. And by double traces, I mean both the double trace conformal block and also the delta derivative of the double trace uh, conformal block. Okay, so may maybe this this was a little fast, but uh, uh, what I want to stress is that okay, the, the, the position space dispersion relation is some completely rigorous mathematical formula and complex analysis for for functions of z and z bar with some with some properties which are satisfied by correlators unit, unitary theories and then from that you can you get another completely rigorous formula which is that you can expand this function in uh, as a sum over with an exchange diagrams in two channels in the s channel and a t channel in this in this case we, the reason we get only two the reason that there is some like broken symmetry between all the three channels is that we started with a fixed u dispersion relation so somehow one channel was was uh, set was set aside was uh, made special and that's that's why we only get two channels so it's kind of similar to the to the approach to the bootstrap advocated by well, first by polekov and by gopak kumar sinha and their collaborators, but it's it's a little different because uh, because we only get the two channels, two, two, two within exchange diagrams. So the right the, now the right hand side is completely crossing symmetric under a switch of S and T, but not under it's not manifestly symmetric under switching say T and U channel. Although it has to be because it comes from a crossing symmetric correlator, it's just not manifest in this on the right hand side. So finally, how do we derive uh, the sum rules from that? Well, all we have to do is to expand the left-hand side using the OPE. So we expanded the right-hand side using the OPE. So on the right-hand side, we have the polyak of Regi blocks. And on the left-hand side, we just expand using the Euclidean OPE. So you get this, this kind of equation that sum over conformal blocks, the external conformal blocks with of generality is equal to the sum over all the PS plus PT with exactly the same OP coefficients. So that's some two parameter family of sum rules, which somehow reorganizes the crossing equation. If you, if you fix Z and Z bar here, you get some sum rule, which is not the same as the fixing the Z, Z bar in the usual crossing equation, but it's a consequence of it. In particular, the way to get dispersive sum rules, so to get those sum rules which have some double zeros from some point on, you shouldn't just fix zz bar to some finite values, but you should actually expand at small z. So z, z goes to zero. And you can you can actually do this. So this this may sound a bit surprising because you cannot do that in the crossing equation. You know, if you take the crossing equation, you send z to zero, the S channel still converges, but the T channel doesn't converge anymore. So that's not that's not a good thing to do with the crossing equation, but it's it's something you can do with this uh, OP equals PR in, in this Polyakov bootstrap equation. Um, everything is completely uniform. Can I ask a question then? So I, I'm not sure if we had like a separate talk about your previous paper where you introduced this Polyakov Regi blocks. Uh, so I'm not up to date, but can you tell us briefly, you know, that uh, Polyakov bootstrap program started by Sinha, Gopakumar and others, it kind of fizzled out because they had they were not able to fix some ambiguity. So if if instead they use this polycov regi block, can they pursue the program just like they were using they were doing further? What is the feeling? Um yeah, so our 
you know, our play of Wretched Box were definitely inspired by by their work, but it's th there are some important difficulties, and I'm I have difficulties or differences. There, there are different differences. <laughs> uh, maybe I'm going to say differences, but there, there are both yeah. there are the differences between what we did and what they did, and there are also difficulties with uh, sort of rigorously showing what they did using what we did. Okay. Um, yeah. So. Yeah, I, I, I don't I don't really know how to derive a formula which would have which would be completely crossing symmetric on the right, like an expansion for the for the correlator as a sum of s plus t plus u exchange within diagrams. I mean, it it certainly doesn't follow from the dispersion relation kind of logic. Maybe there is some completely different logic which which will lead to it. But okay. I mean, you you can. Uh, I think, but but maybe you don't actually have to do that because you can just use these dispersive sum rules to to say to, to redirive the epsilon expansion. In fact, there was a paper uh, two days ago by Giorgio, Sasha, and Dean where they did exactly that. So they they did something similar, but they were using these Polyakov they were using these Polyakov Regi blocks, but ex expressed in Melon space, not not the fully crossing symmetric Polyakov Regi blocks, to to go to to basically redirive. All the CFT data up to order epsilon to the fourth, and even make some new predictions. So they, they certainly were able to rep reproduce using this logic all the, well, as far as I know, all the all the main results that came out of the uh, you know, the fully crossing symmetric version. And th th then th there is no problem with ambiguity because these these objects are completely fixed. Okay, thank you. But I I think it's still an in conce interesting conceptual question whether Non, non perturbatively you can uh, you can write an expansion like that with which is fully crossing symmetric that's that's a, still an open question okay, so to, to go back to the slide um, as I said we can expand this at small z in that case the single trace blocks cancel so there re remember that the s channel polyak of regi block has the s channel conform block in it so it will identically cancel from the two sides and what you're left with is just double traces so the validity of the sum rule in the expansion around small z is equivalent to the, to the statement that all the double trace conform blocks cancel from the on, on, on the two sides and if you if you remember i wrote some formulas for the polyak for the op of the polyak block which as coefficients involves these alphas and betas. So that's that's what you that's what you get. You just get uh, um, well the sum rules that you get come from these coefficients of the double traces, which uh, we called um, alpha and beta. But maybe that's uh, that's probably all I want to say. Yeah, so it it just the the important point is that uh, there there is a there is some interesting basis of dispersive sum rules. Which is just uh, which is like a change of basis from the usual bootstrap from, from the usual crossing equation. So the, these these coefficients of the double traces alpha and alpha and beta are our basis for the of dispersive sum rules. But but okay, there is an important subtlety which I was sort of ignoring for some parts of the talk and not ignoring for, for other parts, which is the need for subtractions. So these alphas and betas, uh, as we define them with Leonard and Shannon. They are actually not uh, quite valid sum rules. You need to you need to do some subtractions, and we, maybe we can talk about it later if, if people are interested. But uh, I don't think I want to get into the subtleties now. The, the point is that if you if you use this uh, if you use the some nice subtraction in Mellon space, you get some uh, you get a positive space dispersion relation which is already subtracted, so it's universally valid for all for all four point functions, and that will automatically produce for you. Linear combinations of alphas and betas, which are valid. So even though individual alphas and betas are not valid sum rules, like not swappable functionals, the combinations that you get if you follow the subtraction logic are. But uh, yeah, there. Are, I, I don't. I don't think I want to. This was probably too fast. But uh, if people are interested, we can we can talk about it later. Okay. So uh -huh. fi finally, to some to some applications. Domino. Uh, yeah, are there alpha and beta known functions, or how explicit are they? Um, yeah, that's a good question. They are they are 
they are not uh, completely explicit yet. I mean, we have uh, we have some partial results. For example, there's an appendix of our paper where there's a there's a recursion relation for computing alpha and alphas and betas uh, starting from starting from some uh, low, low values of spin of the exchanged uh, operator. So th th there, are, there are some partial results, but it's, it's, not, it's not super explicit. Okay. And it, yeah. in, in fact, it's, it's not, not really clear if you, if you need that. I mean, yeah, we, maybe, yeah, maybe we can talk about that later, like what's, uh, what would be a good, uh, good basis to work out. Like so some of, one of the messages of our most recent paper is that, you know, that it's often more useful to, th to think about some specific linear combinations of betas rather than individual betas, say. And in those cases, there are some more explicit formulas. So you, even, if, even if you don't know the action of individual betas, uh, you can still make some nice uh, predictions. Okay. Okay, so now the, the, the sum rule that I wanna focus on for the rest of the talk is a, is a sum rule that you get if you take the dispersion relation, you expand it at small z or small u at fixed v. So you, you fix the other cross ratio and you take one cross ratio to zero. And you need to work with the subtracted dispersion relation to get a valid, valid sum rule. So in this way, you get one parameter family of sum rules um, that, that we called B, B, V, V is the, B is the name, V is the parameter. And all of these sum rules for every value of V have double zeros on all the double traces for all the subleading double traces. So they are not, the sum rule does not vanish, doesn't have a double zero on the leading double trace. So just with two delta phi, but on all the higher double traces, it does. And there is some explicit formula for, for its action. So it's some um, some double in, double integral in the in the cross ratio space. You, so u prime v prime are integrated over some specific region fixed by the value of v of the of some kernel. So this kernel in blue, which is uh, which is com which is completely positive in the region of integration, times the d disk of the conformal block. So uh, th 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 this is this is this is how the how the thermal acts on a conformal block, uh, and this. Uh, so you, you can you can see from from this formula that uh, in the region where this integral converges, which is above above the leading twist, you get the double zeros on all the double traces. And furthermore, the result is non-negative because the conformal block uh, it's like in the yeah it's it's in the Lorentzian region where the conformal blocks are positive and they are like they're power series with uh, positive coefficients. And, and the, the fact that there is there's some non double zero on the leading twist is just that this integral stops converging there, but uh, the, the, you, you, can, you can regularize it. And th th there's a rigorous way to define the sum rule also, also for those conformal blocks. Okay, so j just the important part is that it's, it's not negative rigorously for just from, just from staring at this integral above the leading twist. And also it has the double zeros above the leading twist. And in, in fact, uh, we, we realized that uh, the sum rule is, uh, is equivalent to a version of the superconvergence sum rule. So the superconvergence sum rules essentially tell you, some, tell you about co commutativity of space-like separated light, light ray operators. So in the specific case, uh, when you have four external identical scalars, and you also need to you also need to replace the co correlator with some rescaled correlator, which improves the Reggie behavior. Uh, and so if you, if you do that, you get um, the superconvergence sum rule just becomes the sum rule for this functional. Okay, so what, what, can, we, what can we do with the sum rule? Um, well, one, one claim is that we can get out of it an extremal functional for the twist gap problem. So the, the state, the, yeah. How, how does this how does this work? So the you know the, the claim is that in all in all such four point functions with identical scalars, there always has to be an operator whose twist a, a non-identity operator whose twist has to be smaller than or equal to two delta phi. So this is saturated by by the mean field theory. I mean you, you can you can see this easily just from the inversion formula or from like like on bootstrap that anomalous dimensions of the leading twist are non-negative. But it would be nice to show this using a, 
a function. And you can, you can do that. So you, starting from this BV from the previous slide, you can, I mean, the, the problem with BV is that, that on the leading twist family, it's, it doesn't have simple zeros, but you can create simple zeros on the leading twist family by sort of anti-symmetrizing under T and U. So uh, that's, maybe the, yeah, this, the, the, the details are not important, but uh, somehow th this, this is an operation which switches the sign of odd spin operators and it, it kills the, yeah, it, it creates simple zeros on the leading twist family on the even spins, not on the odd spins, but on the even spins. And once you have this, this anti-symmetrized version of BV that uh, we can call B tilde, you just expand it to the leading order at a specific point and behold, you, you get a nice function with nice positivity properties. So somehow the positivity properties of this one are not as manifest as those of BV, but they are, they are, they are inherited. So you still need to work hard to, to show the positivity, but, uh, but uh, we, we checked it in many examples, and it seems like this functional is the universal, is a, a universal twist gap uh, extreme of functional. So it, it works for all values of the dimension greater than or equal to two, and also for all unitary delta phi. So the, the claim is that this functional proves that there must exist a primary with a twist less than or equal to two delta phi and spin, which needs to be, which needs to be non-zero. Non but that's actually because the functional is, is not negative on all scalars. So yeah, this is what it looks like. It's, it's got double zeros everywhere, except for the leading twist uh, spinning operators. It's not negative on all scalars and it's also not negative above the leading twist uh, for, for spinning operators. So it's, it, it's, uh, it, it sort of generalizes the the, the twist gap functional discovered by Joao, Joao and, and Sasha, which, which worked in some, in some uh, finite range of delta phi. And uh, how, can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. so, so just to make sure, because we believe that it's, uh, that this statement is true for every spin, not just for some spin, but that's yeah, not, that, that's, that's not shown for the moment. I'm going to do that on the, on the next slide. Okay. Yeah, so exactly as Slava said, uh, we believe that there is a stronger statement to be made, which is that in fact, there has to be such an operator for all non-zero spin. For each uh, two, four, six, J, the optimal upper bound on the twist gap is expected to be saturated by a mean field theory. And again, this, uh, there is a, like a, an argument for that from the Lycon bootstrap. Okay. So you can, you can trust the inversion formula for spins two and higher, and the contribution of every primary to the anomalous dimension is negative. And in fact, this uh, this was uh, somewhat discussed in the in famous uh, solving the three Dsing paper, where they had a uh, you, know, you, you can you can make the plot of the bound upper bound of twist gap for various spins, and of course the the most famous the most famous plot is for spin zero. So you you assume only unitarity bound in all spinning sectors, and you impose a gap on the dimension or twist in, in the scalar sector. And what you find is this uh, famous curve with a kink, uh, supposedly where the 3D ising model is. And, and then what these people did is that they repeated the same exercise for higher spins. So you just impose uh, unitarity bound in scalars and everything, all these spinning sectors except for a specific J. And what you find is that uh, the bound seems to be going to a straight line and it's precisely the, the mean field theory. So this, this is some, numerical evidence, some alternative numerical evidence for this claim. Uh, so it's, it's like, a, it's a pretty natural, natural arena to try to come up with an extreme of functional analytically for that. It would, it would be nice to find the extreme of functional in this case. Uh, so for, for each J greater than zero and even, and each delta phi to prove that, uh, uh, you know, to, to find a functional which has double zeros except for that individual spin. And we managed to do that in some uh, in some simple case. So we did it for j equal to two and some range of delta phi. And the, the way it works is that again you construct this anti-symmetrized BV, and now instead of expanding around specific v, you need to you need to do some more complicated operation. So but basically, this is still a one-parameter family of some rules, and uh, 
you can you, know, you can apply some kernel to that parameter like you can um, you can act on that parameter to 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 get a, to get a fixed functional so there's a unique functional in this family somehow which has the right structure of zeros to be an extreme function for this problem so that, that, that one always exists for every j and every delta phi but only for only certain range of delta phi it has the right positivity properties to be an extreme functional so yeah and and the, so the the other thing that we that we have some evidence of is that in this case the extreme function is actually non-unique that there is some ambiguity in, in in the cases where our our functional works has the right positivity properties you can still add something to it which will not violate any of the required properties and uh, there is also some evidence for that from the numerics so it looks like in the in the numerics as you increase n max uh, the action of the functional on spinning operators doesn't actually really converge so it it always has the right positivity properties and the right double zero properties but it, it it's, it's not like there is a unique functional in this in this specific problem yeah incidentally the action on blocks is unique for the scalar blocks but not for the spinning blocks that's related okay, to the okay. existence of uh, yeah can I ask a question concerning this non-uniqueness? Yeah. Is there some, uh, is this somehow reflected by something which we did not explore? So if you just try to maximize, say, uh, gap for spin two and go to the bound, do you see that the spectrum, of, and then you apply extremal functional method, do you see that the spectrum stabilizes as you, as you maximize, the, or do you see that there's something fishy going on, not unlike in any other bound maximization? I think, I think the spectrum should still stabilize to be the mean field theory, but uh, the, the value of the functional in between the operators doesn't stabilize. Okay. There, there's, there's still a unique solution to crossing with that gap. Okay. But the functional itself has some ambiguity. Okay. Thanks. Okay, and then one one more thing, one last thing before I conclude that that we did is that we we took this uh, took this sum rule, so the the sum rule from the previous slide, uh, the the one which which is a simple zero on j equals to two double leading to his double trace and double zeros everywhere else, and we applied it to the three D Ising model. So the three D Ising model actually is in this range where we have an extreme function so it has nice positivity properties and this is so this is what we found uh, yeah, here on the yeah, what, what we did we, we applied it to the to the sigma 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 correlator using uh, using the data for the OPE coefficients and, and almost the, and, and dimensions from from David's uh, David Simon stuff in like on bootstrap paper uh, so this is what the the action of function looks like it's it has nice these beautiful double zeros and it has some there's a simple zero here so the only operator which contributes negatively is the stress tensor so we if we norm let, let's normalize the, the sum rule so that stress tensor contributes as minus one and then let's ask how all the other how, how some of the other operators contribute so if stress tensor is like minus hundred percent then the the energy operator goes gives you 95 percent to compensate for it oh, yeah, the, the sum of all of them needs to be zero so the epsilon operator alone amounts to a 95 percent uh, satisfaction of the sum rule if you include epsilon prime you get additional two percent if you include the next uh, spin two operator the t prime you get another one percent so just from these four operators in the OP, you already get a sum rule which is satisfied to 98% accuracy. So it's, in some, you can reformulate it and say it leads to some approximate identity, but my identity is satisfied by the by the low energy data of the 3D using like the, the central charge which appears in this uh, in this uh, OP coefficient, and the delta epsilon, delta epsilon prime, and that's etc. And what this, uh, yeah. And by the way. You know, all, all of the other operators just keep adding positive numbers here. So the contribution of all these other operators needs to be 2%. Um, so it's- uh, so, so this is a bit different from what we found in, in, in the sum rule when we did this exercise. Like the, for us, 
we had to sum lots of tails of the leading twist trajectories to get close to three or four percent. So it was, and we saw that uh, there was a power law decay at, at large twist that it was not exponentially convergent. This sum rule is it different here? I, I think that. I think that still at large twist, you will get a power law, but the overall coefficient of the power law is just very small. I see. Probably. Yeah. So. Yeah, I, I think these general features like the power law contribution at large tail and must, must be the same for our sum rules and your sum rules. Okay, any questions before I conclude? So just to summarize, uh, summary is that there is a large set of uh, useful OP sum rules which arise from the conformal dispersion relations. And these sum rules give you a bridge between different approaches to the bootstrap, the Polyakov style bootstrap where you cancel double traces, uh, bootstrap and melon space, closing space, uh, it's it's also closely connected to the numerical bootstrap because they are essentially, these sum rules are essentially extremal functionals in some cases, and you can also reproduce like on bootstrap. So all of these approaches are somehow tied together in, in this uh, dispersive sum rule logic. And it's, it's still largely unexplored. Like uh, there's important questions about positivity that uh, are kind of hard to address. So we haven't done that. And it's, it's a large space of sum rules which uh, should be explored and see what their consequences are. Like, uh, one thing I can highlight is uh, what I already mentioned, is this recent work on the epsilon expansion and rhythm diagrams uh, in the paper that came out a few days ago. And there are hopefully many things to be done. Something that we are still working on is uh, to, use, to use this uh, logic to bound uh, holographic CFTs. Um, so it will be good to clarify the connection to superconvergence. Maybe that will, that will give some, some better intuitive picture for where should we expect positivity and when not. And it, it'd, be, it'd be like nice to understand everything more from a more physical point of view rather than just from the point of view of complex analysis. And uh, generalize it to other cases like different external operators and maybe use this as a different basis to do, to do numerics. Okay, so that's, uh, that's all I wanted to say, thank you. Thanks, Dalmil. Questions? I, I have a question. So Dave, in David's paper from a few years ago, um, he used a light cone bootstrap to constrain the low energy data of the Ising model. Mm -hmm. And, it, and he, didn't, he, he tried to close the loop and didn't quite have enough sum rules to close the loop. And I think maybe if he had one or two more inputs, then it would have given what you could call sort of a approximate analytic solution of the Ising model. Yeah. Is your sum rule independent of the ones that he, do you know? Is it independent of the ones he had there? Can you can you now close the loop? Um, uh, yeah, I think I think it's in yeah it's it's independent. I mean there there's a whole there's a whole large set of sum rules uh, that you can you can try to use. And yeah, probably probably one nice thing to do would be to do like a, you, you could you could imagine trying to do this for the four correlators, like the, the three different correlators of sigma and epsilons, and just include sigma and epsilon, nothing else, and the stress tensor and nothing else. Like we we haven't done that uh, yet, but uh, it's probably not too hard. But one. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure what, what are you going to what are you going to learn from that though like it it, it, will, it will not be an exact summary right it will not be an exact solution so what what can you what's like well, what you I think it would be exciting to have an analytic solution that was 90 98% accurate for the free dizing model wouldn't it I'd be excited I guess I guess yeah <laughs> Yeah, if, if you if there if it was clear how to how to increase the yeah I I, th I think you're, I think you're right I mean that and the and the promise of being able to systematically increase the precision in the future I think this is a it's a nice uh, nice kind of program sorry I think the, the, the David David was uh, was just trying to say oh, something 
Yeah, I, I, um, uh, I was going to say that um, I, I think, um, so, so the equations that I was trying to use in that case were, um, were kind of funny in, in that they only, I think they only made sense sort of in large spin perturbation theory. So the, the equation was roughly that, like, if you look at the double light cone limit, um, then you can write down uh, contributions to the correlator in the double light cone limit that look like they have vanishing D disk in both channels. And that those, uh, those contributions have to be crossing symmetric. Um, and the reason there that gives it uh, an interesting constraint is because um, those uh, contributions to the correlator um, are not ones that are automatically cross and symmetric from like the, the way the light cone bootstrap works. Like the light cone bootstrap, you can systematically match a block in one channel in terms of blocks in the other channel. But when you do that, you get this sort of leftover stuff, which are the things that are, uh, that have vanishing D disk in both channels. Um, but the, to like actually pick out what this leftover stuff is, uh, you have to like expand anomalous dimensions, expand it in anomalous dimensions and, and organize terms into logs and double logs and so on. And I didn't really know how to make sense of that um, non-perturbatively. Um, so it was the kind of thing that where you could do for like the, the leading family in the icing model because the anomalous dimensions are small. And so you can kind of, uh, you write down a condition that seems like it should be satisfied. Um, uh, but yeah, so I, I think it would be interesting to try to figure out what those conditions, like the non-perturbative version of those conditions using, um, using these analytic functionals, which are, are rigorously defined. Uh, it's not totally obvious to me which functional is the same as those conditions. Although that's not necessary for doing this exercise because it may be that those conditions are not the best ones for coming up with this pseudo analytic solution to the icing model. But I think it would be interesting to understand that. Any other questions? Yeah, maybe I have a, I have a quick question. Hi, Dalimil. Um, there is another uh, area where, where uh, we see double zeros at, uh, double, at uh, double twist dimensions. It's basically when you take the Fourier transform, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so do you, do you know if there is any connection between your work and, and anything that would be done in momentum space or I don't know. Um, I mean, there, there should be, it was, it, it's already kind of, a, it was a nice surprise that uh, in Mellon space and Bosnian space give you the same thing. So now it shouldn't be a surprise if momentum space gave the same thing. So, yeah, I, I agree with you, but. You haven't, uh, <laughs> you haven't really thought about it. I okay, okay. Yeah, I mean, it's, is it like is it known how how to get go say between momentum and melon space and then worked out? There there are these, but um, I don't think anything uh, completely clean exists. Yeah, yeah, I I think yeah, one of the main messages of this is that there are, there are many different ways of talking about the same sum rule. So probably momentum space. Uh, would uh, be like that too, and but uh, okay, each of the different spaces has some virtues. Maybe Poisson space makes the positivity manifest because you can write these kinds of integrals, like here, where where the action is, is manifestly positive. Mellon space uh, very often is more things are more computable. Then, in, like the, for example, this integral you can't really do in a closed form in general. But in Mellon space, uh, one can some more progress. So yeah, maybe momentum space will uh, 
maybe the answer to all, all the problems at the same time, or maybe a different problem. Well, maybe, maybe there is a connection with also the super convergence. Yeah, you know, I was, can, I, can I make yeah, a comment about that? Okay, perfect. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so, so I think the one advantage of, of having an interpretation in terms of the equation at the bottom of uh, Dolly Mill's current slide is that that equation is, it's like a physics equation and it's true regardless of what coordinates you use for anything. So you could choose to, you could choose to, um, you know, use whatever coordinates you want. You could use different kinds of coordinates for each of the operators in the equation. And it will still right. be true. Right. And it, in particular, you could consider going to conformal collider physics kinematics for, uh, for this thing where you put the initial and final state in momentum space. And one nice thing about that is it, it makes the conformal blocks um, in, in, at least in uh, the channel where you read from, from right to left, um, it makes the conformal blocks factorize into products of three point functions in, this, in the yeah, way that absolutely. we like in momentum space. So you could yeah. do that if you wanted to. Um, I'm not sure that it make it's, yeah, it's not obvious what uh, properties of the sum rule it makes manifest to do this, but, but it might be interesting. Anything else? Maybe hi Tom, hi Delano. Can I ask a question? Hi, hey, is it here? Yes. So you mentioned at the end uh, your last bullet point, I think, about numerics, and uh, um, I wanted to ask. So what is uh, what ex what exactly is the status, and what is missing, uh, and what has to be done to to actually do numerics with this with these functionals? Yeah, yeah, so maybe first let me say why why it could be a good idea to be numerous with these functionals. And the reason is just that um, ultimately the optimal functionals in the bootstrap look kind of similar to these dispersive functionals. And in, in some cases they are literally the same as I, as I showed. So in, in the other day we are converging to something, in the numerics we are converging to something with these double zeros. So we should maybe try to start with an ansatz which incorporates the structure and which kind of already incorporates a lot of the, the analytic bootstrap insights. Uh, however, the part that is challenging is, uh, is essentially, it has to do with positivity. It has to do with the fact that uh, the, the usual numerical bootstrap basis, which consists of uh, derivatives at the crossing symmetric point has, has some very nice properties, namely that it's automatically sign uniform at large, at large dimension. Like if you flick spin and you, you take a large delta, the functional in the numerical bootstrap is dominated by the largest derivative and it's sign uniform. And so that, that's, that's I, I think the main challenge to, basically you, you, want to, you want to work with the, you always want to work with the basis of functionals which has this property that, uh, that for large quantum numbers, all the functions in your basis should have should have a uniform sign, and all the all the interesting physics is happening in some compact region around the origin in the delta and j space, just like it, it's happening in the usual numerical bootstrap. So what's I think what's well maybe missing, but we we had some comments on that in the in the paper is to is to come up with uh, with a base like with some with a basis for these dispersive sum rules, which has this asymptotic positivity, uh, well, so, such that there is only a, some compact negative, compact region where the sign can be anything, and ab ab outside of that region, the sign is uniform. And one nice thing about it is that, like, you really just need one function of that property, because then you can, you know, you can add, like, then you, you can sort of work in the, in the convex cone around that, Around a functional where just adding some uh, the other functional with small coefficients does not violate this uh, asymptotic positivity property, but uh, we haven't actually used it in in any numerics. Uh, maybe David wants to add something to to what I said. He's been thinking about that maybe more. I don't know. Uh, um, right. So 
one of the things we did in the paper is we wrote an example basis that you could in principle use for numerics. And even getting that example is non-trivial. One of, we had, as Dolly Mill said, we had to have at least one functional that was asymptotically positive. Um, and um, uh, um, let's see, one functional that is asymptotically positive. And um, yeah, we chose, we chose this phi two functional, this, uh, this extremal functional for the twist cap problem. Oh, sorry, sorry, extremal functional for the spin two twist cap problem. Okay. It's actually escaping my mind why we um, didn't, let's see. Uh, right, the problem with the, with the extremal functional for just tau uh, at all spins is that it's negative below the double, uh, double twist threshold um, for the leading family. And so you can't, you can't just use that you can't have that be your functional, your positive functional, because it's not actually asymptotically positive. Because we need, we also care about that regime below the the, uh, the leading family. So the only thing we could find that was asymptotically positive in sort of a big enough region at large quantum numbers was this phi two, which is a little weird. I mean, it's you know you have to work kind of hard to get this phi two functional, but so the only concrete proposal then is phi two. And then once you have phi two, you can add to it any set of spin two uh, convergent, um, sorry, any set of physical functionals you want. Uh, and there, there's some uh, ambiguity. It's not clear which set to choose, but, but we proposed some, some set. So that's, that's the first thing. Yeah, it's like this asymptotic positivity is kind of non-trivial and, uh, um, yeah, so it's interesting that it's not trivial. I don't know what else to say about that. And the other thing is just uh, for using these things in numerics, um, uh, one needs to use a different uh, numerical algorithm than what, um, well, you, you can't use semi-definite programming in the usual way that we use it, but you could probably use um, the solver in Jula Boots um, to do this. In fact, maybe Miguel has ex already experimented with um, similar things. Um, so I think that, yeah, one could already start playing with the basis that we proposed. Uh, it'd be in interesting to see how it works. And the final comment is that uh, we had a plot in our paper uh, showing the numerical functional uh, versus this analytical functional for the spin two gap problem. And um, as Dolly Mill said, it's not, uh, the answer is, doesn't seem to be unique for, uh, for higher spins. So the numerical functional isn't converging to anything in particular in an obvious way. But for spin zero, there is a unique answer for this, uh, for this functional. Um, and so you can look at the numerical functionals computed using the derivative basis and see how fast they converge to the uh, exact analytic functional. Um, and um, uh, and it looks like um, uh, the the convergence is very non-uniform, and it looks like it's pretty slow at high twist. It would be interesting to understand what that what the convergence rate is, um, and also the significance of that of that convergence rate. In other words, like you know how how well does this is an opportunity to see how well the derivative basis performs really as we get, get close to the to a known analytical answer. So th those are the comments that I was going to make. Thanks. Okay, I'll stop the recording and we can keep discussing if people want to hang around. Let's thank Dalmil again. Thank you, Dalmil.